I, well, it's a black screen that says Dwight Foster Public Radio, uh, Dwight Foster Public Library. Now, when I click on the gallery version, I see Dwight Foster and then just, there you are, I can see you now. All right, so you can see me. Yes. That's not what I need you to be. Oh, I think I know what's going on here. Okay. Are you seeing anything different? Uh, not yet, no. Let's see if I go full screen. Okay. Well, supposedly this thing could be doing that part, but um, I don't want to take up any more pe of people's time doing this. Yeah. Kind of thing. I think we just need to go for it and Okey -doke. make it work as well as we can. Sure thing. All right. So, Mr. Don, are you going to start us off? Yes. Okay. I came prepared tonight, folks. I had to do this on large prints so I could read it. Okay. Uh, animals, they play a great part in military history. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the U.S. Veterans Project Library, U.S. program number nine. Now, we want to, uh, well, let me ask you this now. You are watching us now on the, on the internet. And uh, those of you at home, uh, I'm going to take up about maybe three or four minutes of commercialism here, if you will. And uh, I'm going to ask all the people at home if one of you would get out of the sofa or the lazy lounge and pick up the telephone and call a friend or a relative or a neighbor or, or somebody that you know is a veteran or on active duty right now, give them a call. Have them turn up their, their uh, uh, laptop and watch this program, uh, <clears throat> because I'm sure they'll be you'll be very interested in it. Now, uh, you sort of want to miss the program. So we we found that uh, animals play a great part in our military history. It goes back to the Civil War days. And then, of course, World War I and up to the present, we had canine involvement, uh, dogs, of course. And uh, as I say, the uh, uh, animals have played a great part in our military history, even to the point where our military branches, our military academies have what we call mascots. We not only have four-legged animals as mascots, but we have birds. Now, the Air Force adopted a falcon, and the falcon is housed at the uh, Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. The Army, years ago, adopted a mule as a mascot and is uh, housed at the United States Military Academy of West Point in New York. The Navy adopted a goat. That's their mascot, and they keep that at the uh, Naval Academy in Annapolis. And uh, the Marines adopted a bulldog, which is kept at uh, housed at uh, Quantico, Virginia. Now, <clears throat> upon request, uh, now, too, well, first of all, let me give you a little bit of background of U.S. Uh, Veterans Project Library.org, or, or U.S., I should say. That's not U.S., but uh, we started this program in November of 2017, and it is designed to, um, to educate the American citizens, American people in military affairs. Now, when I say military affairs, let's take an example. You want to know something about the Revolutionary War. You can go to your public library, pull the book off the shelf, and read about George Washington, the Revolutionary War, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can, you can look up in, uh, history of our 
Native American Indians. You look up history of uh, of our founding fathers, and just on and on. Anything related to military subjects. Uh, if you have a loved one or a neighbor or a friend that's in the military, and you want to know what he or she is, what their MOS is, what their stuff is. Uh, well, if they're, let's say you have a friend that's a uh, torpedo man on the submarine, you can go to your public library, pull the book off the shelf. Okay, well, Joe, he's a torpedo man. This is what he does. This is where he's assigned. Then you have access to the computer room at the library. You can go into the computer room, send them an email, communicate with them if you don't have a computer in your home facility. Now, also, we are hopeful that, too, that we can bring in the history of our military academies as well as each branch of service. Now, in the past, we have had uh, programs here where we had the Coast Guard come in and give history of the Coast Guard. Uh, we've had the uh, uh, Marine Corps. We had Colonel Wendy Goya here uh, on the 101st anniversary of the Women's Marine Corps, uh, fresh from the Pentagon, and uh, given us history of the Women's Marine Corps, and so on and so forth. And we will continue to do this uh, to help educate the American people in uh, military affairs. Now, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I had to make my cheat sheet up here, folks. Uh, now, the, uh, now the Air Force, as I mentioned, uh, they have, uh, in Colorado Springs, they have, they have the falcon. Oh, one more animal I want to bring in, talking about birds. Right, the Air Force has a, has a falcon in uh, the Civil War, during the Civil War, a uh, young Indian, found a baby, uh, 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 I don't say falcon, uh, eagle. eagle, thank you. Uh, and they trained that eagle to, shall we say, be a forward observer for a Wisconsin infantry unit. And that eagle would fly out Come back with information, and we and the Indian would follow that, that eagle and the troops would to where the enemy was located, and so on and so forth. The, the uh, eagle's name, they named him Old Abe. And for those of you who are watching us or listening to us, uh, you can go on your computer and uh, log on to the Veterans Museum in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, get all the information on old Abe. So again, animals have played an important part in military history. Now, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce to you uh, former Sergeant of the United States Marine Corps. Uh, what else did you do, Tom? Okay. Okay, Tom Rolla. Thank you very much. Tom? Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to um, also welcome you to the Dwight Foster Public Library here in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. And tonight you're going to hear how a horse become a true hero. And uh, okay, first of all, I would like to thank Amy in the library. And I would like to thank my good friend, Sergeant Marine Sergeant Don Millar, of which is a Korean vet. And also happy Veterans Day to all the veterans. And yesterday was my record birthday. So happy birthday, Marines and simplify. Okay, we're going to learn about uh, this horse called Sergeant Reckless. So, and also, I would love to thank Robin uh, for her contr con contributing to this, because if it was not for her, Sergeant Reckless would not be alive today, because it was due to her research and her book, Sergeant Reckless, American War Hero, that brought Sergeant Reckless back to life. 
So again, thank you very much, Robin. Okay, who was Sergeant Reckless? Sergeant Reckless was a Mongolian born mayor and she was bred to be a racehorse. And she did not become a racehorse. It was due to a recoilless rifle unit of the 5th Marines that desperately needed a pack horse. So this uh, young lieutenant from the unit took it upon himself to take two other Marines in hopes of purchasing the horse. They went to Seoul, they went to Seoul and they went to uh, the racetrack. They did purchase the horse. And on after they got then they went back to uh, their outpost. And when they got back to the outpost, okay, the uh, the horse was introduced to a gunnery sergeant. And the gunnery sergeant became the horse's trainer. And uh, a little later, the horse and the, all of the men in the unit they became, uh, there was a, a big bond between them. Uh, the bond was so great that it was like a family bond. The men loved her, she loved the men. And there was, she was even allowed to sleep in the tents during the inclement weather. She even sniffed around the mess hall and she wound up, she was able to eat mess with them. Yeah, and uh, she did have, she had numerous likes, like she liked scrambled eggs, bacon, coffee, beer, Coke, and uh, numerous other likes. And uh, she also had some dislikes. And she, dis she disliked dogs. And she disliked goats because the goats reminded her of the dogs. <laughs> and the young horse also had some fears. And I, I think that her, her, one of her biggest fears was barbed wire. And that was due to her training that she received from the gunnery sergeant. And during her illustrious career in the Marine Corps. She was, had promotions and she was also issued numerous medals, both from the United States and France. And that was due to her service and her extraordinary courage under fire. So now ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear how Sergeant Reckless became America's war hero. All right. Hold on. What's going on? Well, it worked before. It's fully flummoxed. Okay, what happened? Boy, this is just not my day. <laughs> well, I can hear you. I just can't hear your video right now, which we heard earlier. All right, think, Amy, what could be stopping this?
Aha. That's what was dropping it. Okay. Hi, I'm Robin Hutton, and I'm the author of Sergeant Reckless, America's War Horse. And I am here today to do a PowerPoint presentation uh, to tell you all about this incredible hero that is America's greatest war horse. And she's also listed in Life Magazine as one of our all-time greatest heroes. And you'll learn more about that in a moment. So I'm going to do a PowerPoint and show you some of the pictures that are in my book and tell you some of the fun things that we're doing with Star Trek Reckless. And so let me get started. So these are the covers of my two books, uh, Sergeant Reckless and War Animals of World War II. Uh, incredible stories about these animals that have served our country from uh, uh, in Korea and in World War II that I think you'll really, really enjoy. So in 1997, Reckless was listed in Life Magazine as one of our all-time greatest heroes with um, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa. And yet she had disappeared from the pages of history. When I discovered her story back in 2007, I believe, there were only four things that came up on the internet when I Googled her name. And I thought, man, this is a travesty. Because when you hear her story, when you see the pictures, when you understand what this little pony did, you would be amazed, I think, as much as I was, to wonder why and how did this horse disappear? I think I kind of know why. But uh, I have made it my mission to bring her back to the collective and make sure that she has never been forgotten again. And uh, you'll see all about that in just a few minutes as to what we've done. So Reckless was, would carry ammunition for the recoilless rifle platoon. And this gentleman right here in this picture, this is Lieutenant Eric Pedersen. And Lieutenant Eric Pedersen is the one that purchased Reckless for his platoon. Her Korean name was Ah Chim Hae and uh, called Flame in the Morning or Morning Sun. And so he paid $250 of his own money to buy this horse for his men because as you can see, it was very difficult to carry this gun up the hill. Pedersen thought that if he could get a, uh, an animal or a pack animal to help his men, that would be amazing. And so that's when he went to the Seoul racetrack. The gun is called a reckless rifle. Uh, because you had to have a little bit of uh, recklessness to be associated with it. It's also a contraction of its name. But you can see in this picture on the below, you can see the back blast here. And that would show the enemy where you were firing from. And so you could only fire maybe two, three, four at the most if you were firing really fast. And then you'd have to pick up the gun and run to another part of the hill. Otherwise, you would be hit with incoming fire from the enemy. And uh, so it was a very dangerous weapon to be associated with. It weighed um, about 106 pounds, and it was a very big gun, an anti-tank weapon, as you can see the men trying to carry it up. So on October 26, 1952, Lieutenant Pedersen went to the Seoul racetrack looking for his pack horse. And there he found Reckless. And she was in a stall, and she was owned by a young Korean man named Kim Huk Moon. And um, when he saw her, he couldn't believe how beautiful and refined she was and how well Kim had taken care of her. He'd really taken great care of her because he loved this horse, and this was going to be his racehorse when the war ended. Um, and because Reckless was bred to be a racehorse uh, on the tracks of Seoul. So um, when Pedersen saw her, she actually came up to him and he saw how well taken care of he was. And he offered the man $250 of his own money. It was his own money that he did, used. And the only reason Kim Huckman sold his beloved horse to the Marines was to buy an artificial leg for his sister, um, Chim, uh, Chung Soon, who lost her leg in a landmine accident during the war. And so this money would help her tremendously to get on with her life and have a better life. And so um, he gave uh, Reckless up for $250. When they got to camp, they didn't know what to call her, so they named her Reckless. And uh, Pedersen wondered who in camp knew how to work with horses. And uh, Gunnery Sergeant Joe Latham uh, said, sir, I can do it. And so Joe was responsible for putting Reckless through Huff Camp. It's the equine version of boot camp. And here are some of the amazing pictures. They had to train her to get in and out of this trailer. Uh, Joe taught her to lay down, to run to her bunker and get down when there was incoming fire. 
He taught her how to step over communication wires and uh, look for barbed wire. She was afraid of barbed wire. Um, and they would take her, they would walk her, this far picture on the right here, they would walk her up and down the hills with the ammunition that she would carry on her back so she could get used to carrying that weight and uh, get a feel as to what uh, she was going to have to do. The men absolutely loved her and uh, they became her herd and she would follow them anywhere. On cold nights, she would sleep in their tents with them. Uh, if it was raining or if it was cold, she would sleep there with them near the fire. Uh, she ate in their mess tents. She absolutely loved bacon and eggs. She chased it down with a cup of coffee. How she didn't call it is anybody's guess, but she was just this amazing character. And she loved sharing a beer with her men uh, <laughs> after a hard day's work. So each round of the ammunition weighed 24 pounds. And here on the left side picture, you can see the men strapping them to her uh, saddle. They would, they would tie it onto the sawbuck there. And all of the pictures we have with her canisters are of four um, uh, rounds at a time. But you, um, uh, during the heat of battle, she would carry up to eight rounds at a time, sometimes even uh, 10 rounds. So her baptism of fire was late November 1952. They had no idea what she was going to do, but uh, because they couldn't train her for the sound of the noise and the backblast. Uh, they didn't want to waste the rounds of ammunition. So all, I, all they could do was just be there for her during um, the, uh, the shooting, uh, the fire ammunition. So that said that the first time the gun went off, she was loaded down with six rounds and she went straight up in the air off of all fours and she's pulling back and she's shaking and she's just really, really frightened. And Monroe Coleman was her handler at that time. And he's talking to her and he's telling her what a good pony she is and not to worry, the gun goes off again and up she goes again off of all fours. And again, he's trying to calm her down, calm her down. And the third time it went off, she just kind of twitched a little bit because she's kind of getting used to it and knew that he wouldn't let anything hurt her. By the end of the firing mission, she was so comfortable that she wasn't going to be harmed in any way that they found her over sniffing at a hole uh, for a helmet liner that she found. And uh, so they knew that she had gotten quite comfortable with the gun that quickly and uh, that she was going to be OK, which is utterly amazing. So there were several firing missions in the winter of 1953. Uh, at the end of January, she'd been on others besides these. These are just the big ones where uh, she did uh, a lot and carried a lot, but there were smaller missions uh, along the way. But uh, these were all kind of getting her prepared for her next really big mission, the, her, the, her day of destiny, I guess you could say which was the Battle of the Nevada Cities in uh, March of uh, 1953. This was a five-day battle from the 26th of March to the 30th. Uh, she started in on the 27th uh, the next day. Um, what happened was on March 26th, the men were up on the outpost. Uh, she was working with the uh, guys that were um, working up on outpost Vegas. Only 45 to 50 men were on an outpost at a given time. And on the night of the 26th, 3,500 Chinese and communist North Koreans descended on all of these outposts. So the outposts were not able to help each other defend, uh, defend themselves. They had to do it themselves. Um, uh, they could only take care of their own. And so they were immediately overrun and taken over uh, that first night. And then Reckless started her mission the next day. And it's amazing what this little had done. And this battle at the time was written was one of the most savage battles in Marine Corps history. And if you think of um, Iwo Jima or Bella Wood or some of those other um, images of battles from like World War II, you get an idea of the enormity of this particular battle um, that happened uh, on the Nevada cities. So Reckless Finest Hour came uh, during this battle. Um, they would lead her up to the guns to show her the way, but this battle was so fierce that she would have to make the trips most of the time by herself. And in this particular battle in one day, she made 51 trips up to the guns, mostly alone. They would strap the ammunition on her, give her a slap, and up the hill she would go. When she got to the guns, they took the ammunition off, give her a slap, and down the hill she went. And she did this time and time again. 
Um, she walked 35 miles up and down these hills and across open rice paddies and uh, carried 386 rounds of ammunition, which is over 9,000 pounds on her back. That's almost five tons of ammunition this little horse carried on her back. It was such a fierce battle. It was so chaotic. And horses usually flee from the chaos and reckless ran right towards it. But with 500 rounds a minute, you couldn't tell on the radar screen what was coming and what was going. It was just a blur. And so the rounds would collide midair and they would rain down on the troops like fireworks. And so Reckless was actually hit with flying, uh, falling shrapnel. She was hit in the forehead and she was hit in the left flank. But that didn't stop her when Joe Latham saw the wounds, he dressed them and she was still able to go back to work. Uh, she even carried wounded off the battlefield. We don't know how many wounded she carried, but in my book, I talk about uh, during all these battles, uh, I have at least three verified cases of her carrying wounded down off the battlefield, which was uh, really, really something. And uh, this battle uh, broke the spine of the enemy. By the end of the fifth day, um, everybody was able to take back the outposts, the main line of resistance, which had they broken through from these outposts, uh, they would have, the enemy would have had a direct charge to Seoul, and we would have had quite a different outcome at that point. And uh, because of this, uh, because the Marines, and uh, they were able to stay on these outposts and claim them and fight back the enemy, um, they, uh, the war ended just a few months later in July. And a lot of that credit was given to, given to Reckless because of what she was able to do um, in that battle in carrying all this ammunition up. Uh, it was amazing. So the war ends on July 27th, 1953. Uh, Reckless was actually promoted to corporal sometime in here because of her heroics. The picture here of her having a beer is with Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Gear, And Andrew Gear would be the one to really take her story on. He was a big writer back in his day. He wrote movie scripts with John Wayne. He did uh, Great Barrier Reef and Sands of Iwo Jima. And um, he just wrote a lot of different stories. And um, he wrote the original book on Sergeant Reckless that came out. But um, here, this was... Uh, right after, uh, after the war ended and they went out and celebrated, of course, with the beer. So Reckless was promoted in, um, in Korea. Uh, her men started leaving her um, after the war ended and the armistice was signed. And so new people came in uh, to take care of her and became their, her friends. But she was promoted to sergeant on April 10th, 1954. So a week later after her uh, promotion to sergeant, Andrew Gear wrote a article and uh, it was in the Saturday Evening Post and it appeared on April 17th, 1954. Now remember, all of the men that she served with in the battles a year before are, were gone, essentially. And so the end of the um, article stated that Reckless was still trapped on the hills of um, South Korea with the hopes of coming home one day. Well, when this article appeared, it, there was a national outcry to get this horse home. What happened was uh, an executive, Stan Koppel, uh, at uh, one of the uh, shipping lines, uh, saw the article and his kids made them, him promise that he would do everything to get Reckless home. So he offered free transportation if the Marines could get her to Japan and get home. And, uh, and, and so on October 17th, 1954, they gave her a rotation ceremony and they did everything they could to send her off in grand fashion. And it was just a glorious day. And so she got on the ship in Japan and she arrived in America on November 10th, 1954. Now that just happens to be Marine Corps birthday. You can't make this stuff up. She actually touches American soil here in this bottom picture on Marine Corps birthday, 1954. And she was guest of honor at the Marine Corps birthday that night in San Francisco. She had more press turn out for her on the docks of San Francisco than then Vice President Nixon did 
uh, a couple of weeks earlier. I mean, she was a rock star. And so everybody poured out to see her and to support her. So she goes to the Marines Memorial Club in San Francisco. She waltzes through the hotel, gets in the elevator and goes up to the 10th floor uh, to the celebration. She waltzes into the ballroom. They said flash bulbs went off like mortar shells. There were so many pictures, people trying to take her picture and everything. And just uh, as she got through the door, she spies the anniversary cake and she goes trotting over to it and she's up to her nostrils in it before the guys can get a hold of her. But that was okay because they had another cake upstairs uh, for the grand celebration of when they, they do uh, the grand honor of giving the first piece of cake to the honored uh, Marine in the room. And uh, that was reckless. And uh, here is Kay Pedersen, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, oh, Lieutenant uh, Eric Pedersen's wife, giving her the first piece of cake. And then the bottom picture here is, uh, is Kate and uh, Eric with Reckless. And then when she finished with the cake, she started in on the centerpieces, of course. And um, I mean, she was just this amazing, funny character. So the next day they take her down, they drive her down to Camp Pendleton where she uh, is going to live out her days. So at Camp Pendleton, she was promoted twice to Staff Sergeant. The first time was with Colonel Richard Rothwell and uh, her little Colt Fearless is at this um, ceremony to honor his mom as well. This was in 57 and then two years later, the pay grades changed. And so they used that moment to promote her again to uh, an E6 to uh, Staff Sergeant. And the gentleman uh, pinning on her Staff Sergeant stripes here is the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the number one Marine in the country. And that is General Rand McCall Pate, who pinned on her Sergeant stripes in Korea. There was a uh, 19 gun salute in his honor with Reckless standing there. And then a parade of troops, a parade of 1,500 troops marched by, uh, marched by them to pay their respects and to honor them. She retired the following year on Marine Corps birthday, 1960. And in lieu of retirement pay, she would have room and board for the rest of her life at uh, Camp Pendleton, all the oats she could eat. Well, Reckless died on uh, May 13th, 1968, and she was buried with full military honors down by the step stables on base at Camp Pendleton. This was the only marker uh, for her on base when I discovered her story and went down to learn her story. So when I saw this, I knew that there was more that I wanted to do for Reckless, that she needed a monument. And so um, in July uh, uh, 19, uh, excuse me, 2013, the very first monument for Reckless right here at the National Museum of the Marine Corps was dedicated. Down here, the second monument is, was in 2016. Uh, that's at Camp Pendleton, and we also have a marker for her at Camp Pendleton. And uh, our third one is at the Kentucky Horse Park uh, up in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, she is at the International Museum of the Horse, and she stands alongside all of the great horses. The fourth one is uh, at the, in Fort Worth, Texas, at the National Cowgirl Museum and Hall of Fame. And that was dedicated last year in November of 2019. There's one more that is in Barrington Hills, Illinois, that is on a farm private farm that works with veterans with PTSD and they work with horses. And so she stands as a symbol and uh, there will be one in Ocala, Florida at the World Equestrian Center next year in 2021. And we're hoping to get her to South Korea as well. So in all of this time, I had discovered in doing research how to honor this horse. What else can we do besides the monuments? And in 2016, I had applied a nominated reckless for the PDSA Dickin Medal. This medal is the greatest award an animal can receive for gallantry and bravery uh, on the battlefield. And this had been given starting in World War II. It's a British medal. It's known as the Victoria Cross for Animals. Reckless was the uh, first American horse to get it. She is the first horse since World War II to get it, um, and the fourth horse in total. 
The other three horses were given it together um, during World War II for their work. And so it was an amazing, amazing honor for Reckless to, uh, to receive this medal. And so when I was over in England, I kept asking, why doesn't America have this kind of medal? Why don't we do something like this to honor our incredible animals? Because there's nothing like that here. And so last year in November, we instituted the brand new Animals in War and Peace Medal of Bravery. Uh, this was up on Capitol Hill. Members of Congress uh, presented the medal. Um, we had this specially made. The metal company that makes the Dick and Metal also designed and made ours. And uh, Reckless is, was awarded Medal of Bravery number one. Even though she was the third war, um, I had a little poll, so I, I made sure she got uh, Medal of Bravery number one. And it was such a great day down here uh, receiving the medal on her behalf. Um, uh, former Senator John Warner presented the medal to Mike Mason, who actually worked, served with Reckless over in Korea um, after the armistice was signed. And Mike uh, loves his horse and has done so much for the preserving her memory and attends all kinds of parades and functions that we have um, to honor her any way, any way we can. And so it's just been this amazing ride, an incredible, incredible ride honoring this horse. And um, her medal will be on display in a new museum that we are putting together, the International War Animals Museum. Uh, we hope to put it in Washington, D.C. area, but we'll also have traveling exhibits, but they will be uh, on display uh, at that time. But anyway, that, that pretty much sums it up. Um, if you want to, uh, here are my phone numbers and the emails and websites you can go to. But let me see if I can get out of this and uh, just kind of say goodbye. But anyway, I just want to thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm so very, very blessed to have this little horse in my life. She has changed my life in ways that I, I can't even explain to you. And in um, doing the Dick and Metal, I was fortunate enough to find out all of the other stories of the animals that received the Dick and Metal and was so blown away by what they had done that um, my latest book, War Animals, The Unsung Heroes of World War II, uh, talks about all those animals um, that got received the Dick and Metal, but also our American animals that uh, work so hard and valiantly in World War II. And I will be starting to do podcasts on them as well. And uh, so just keep coming back to the website uh, to read more and learn more about these amazing animals. You just, I just can't get enough of them and I can't honor them enough. So I just wanna thank you so much for joining me and please, please, please um, uh, pick up the book, go to sergeantreckless.com uh, to learn all about Reckless's story and to see pictures of the different monuments and the celebrations and some of the fun things that we've done to honor her, like being in the National Memorial Day Parade. Uh, we also have races for her at the various top racetracks, uh, like Pimlico is running the fifth, uh, the fifth running of the Sergeant Reckless Memorial Dash, hopefully this year. Um, and so it's just an amazing, amazing ride with this little horse. And so I just wanna thank you all so much for joining me. Please check out uh, her book and, uh, and the website and uh, wareanimals.com. You can check out those animals as well. And also a Medal of Bravery ceremony is on there. And uh, thank you so, so very much for joining me and learning all about Sergeant Reckless, America's greatest war horse. Hi, I'm Robin Hutton, and I'm the author of Sergeant Reckless, America. So we want to announce our, our surprise visitor. Well, now that you have heard <laughs> the story of this amazing horse, we have a surprise question and answer period for you. And if you will, let's give a round of applause for Robin. She is going to be the answer to the question. Are you there, Robin? Hello. How is everybody? 
We're good. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Good, we good. Can't see you, Robin, but we can. <laughs> I'm so sorry you can't see me, but that's okay. You just saw me for about 25 minutes, so I'm sure you've had enough. <laughs> Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Don. And thank you, Amy, for hosting this and letting everybody know this incredible, incredible story about this amazing horse. And I would, uh, if anybody has any questions, I would uh, love to uh, answer any of them if, uh, if, uh, if you'd like. Hey, Robin, this is Don. Hey, Don, I thought I recognized your voice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to know if I, if I can get my beer ration back that they gave to, to uh, the <laughs> she, drank my, she drank my last beer. Well, you know, if you're in Chicago anytime, go down to Crete, Illinois, just south in South Chicago, and there's a brewing company called Evil Horse Brewing Company, and they actually make a Sergeant Reckless Pale Ale. No and way. it is very, very good. <laughs> and that's the only place you can get it? You know, I think, I'm not sure what their distribution is at this point, but you could, uh, you could either call or uh, maybe email them and they'll be able to tell you where it might be locally. I think they, I know that they do travel uh, like down to Kentucky and take deliveries down there. And, and I think some of the surrounding uh, states and counties and stuff. So you can check out with them. I honestly don't know, I'm in California, so I don't, uh, they don't have it out here, sadly. Anybody have a question you'd like to ask Robin? Yeah, Robin, this is Tom. Hi, Tom. Uh, how did Sergeant Reckless die? So it's, it's a sad story. Um, you know, after carrying all that weight on her back, she had uh, developed very bad arthritis in her hips. And she also was developing laminitis in her feet, in her hoofs. And so she was out in the uh, pasture uh, one afternoon and she didn't come in for her, for her evening meal. And when they finally found her, she had fallen into uh, barbed wire and had gotten injured by the barbed wire. And her injuries were quite severe uh, and they felt they could have saved her. But because of the impending um, uh, problems with her hips and her feet, uh, they felt that she would be more comfortable if they just uh, let her go. And so uh, she passed away on, on May 13th uh, after succumbing, basically succumbing to those injuries. And uh, so very, very sad. I, uh, <coughs> excuse me interviewed uh, Eric Pedersen's son, Eric Jr. about this. And when he was telling me, because after she returned to America, she actually spent uh, at least six months to a year, I don't have the exact dates, but she spent that time at the Pedersen Ranch in Vista, California, which is right outside of Camp Pendleton. And uh, because she needed to be quarantined after arriving from, uh, from Japan and from South Korea. So um, Eric Pedersen Jr. was telling me the story and all of a sudden when he starts talking about the, her, when she died, he just broke down into sobs, sobbing. And when he finally finished, he says, as you can see, I still haven't gotten over that one. And uh, so it was, it was just a, it was a very sad time for a lot of people at Camp Pendleton uh, who, you know, were very, very sad about this, her death. But she lived a wonderful life at Camp Pendleton. Uh, you know, she had her three, two, uh, three colts and uh, it was just the bell of the ball everywhere she went and everything she did. And uh, it was just delightful, delightful to see how she would be at events at Del Mar racetrack and they'd pull her out for parades and anytime a dignitary came on base, you know, she would be there. And so it was just really, really something spe special to see what they, 
how they took care of her and, and how they promoted her and used her as a wonderful ambassador for the Marines. Are there any horses today who are descendants of her? Sadly, Amy, no. I was so crushed when I found this out because the, they gelded um, all three of her colts. And oh. I know. Now, I do have tail hair of hers that in my book, there's a picture, a couple of pictures of this little girl, Debbie McCain. Her dad ran the step stables there, uh, Jinx McCain. And um, they would collect uh, horseshoes and tail hair from famous horses. And they have some of Blackjack and I think they have Trigger and they had all, of, and they had Sergeant Recklesses. And so um, Debbie gave me a, a, a you know, a nice swatch of her tail hair. And I was at the Cowgirl Museum in Texas. And one of the gals, you know, they're all into their research and stuff. She goes, with that tail hair, have you thought of trying to clone Sergeant Reckless? And I'm there like, yeah, I don't think that would be a good idea. But um, with every statue that we've done and uh, the Ocala Monument statue now is in place and it's absolutely stunning and it's become the iconic image of the whole World Equestrian Center. If you, if you Google World Equestrian Center, uh, the picture of Reckless pictured in front of this beautiful white hotel is, is the uh, basic logo of the World Equestrian Center and it's just, just beautiful. But we have put tail hair, a little piece of her tail hair inside each monument. So there is a little piece of reckless in each monument, which, which is just, I, I just find delightful. Who designed the monument? So the artist of the monument is Jocelyn Russell. She is a, an artist up in Friday Harbor, Washington. Uh, she uh, is a brilliant artist. Uh, she came to me through one of the Marines that served with Reckless, uh, Bob Rogers. Bob was an artist and he lived in Oklahoma and he would, or Ohio, and he would travel around to different art shows and he knew Jocelyn through the art shows. And she, uh, uh, we talked on the phone and she just seemed to get um, the, get the story and get what she, you know, what I was looking to do. She hit it out of the park. I, I just had no idea how it was going to be, you know, when, when we first discussed it. And, uh, but she's done sculptures in like in New Orleans at the Audubon Zoo. She just did a, a whole uh, big thing of five ele life-size elephants, a pride of five lion, uh, 15 meerkat, beautiful. It's there in their center pool. She's right now working on a uh, uh, mama and a baby giraffe for, a, uh, for the Padawanami Zoo in Indiana. It's absolutely gorgeous, but she's done several huge projects like that. And um, she just really understood and what Jocelyn does and what's brilliant about what she does is she got every single picture that I had, had gotten for my book and um, I had sent her everything. And then she even interviewed some of the men that served with Reckless trying to get an idea of the research into her story. And it's amazing. It's like the, her, the, the information comes into her brain and the artistry comes out of her fingers. And it really was like Reckless was there. And the, the wonderful com compliment to that uh, that I, I got when we installed the first monument at uh, the National Museum of the Marine Corps uh, the director was standing there, Lenny Zell, who became a good friend, and they pull this beautiful piece of bronze out of this, this box, you know, and they place it up on the pedestal to mark it where they need to drill the holes. And she's just stand, you know, sitting up there on this pedestal. And I turned to the director and I said, so what do you think? And she had tears in her eyes and she said, I expect her to move. And that's what you feel when you are in the presence of this monument is you feel her, 
her sense of energy and urgency and determination. And uh, it's, it's truly, it's truly breathtaking, truly, truly breathtaking. Robin, how did you start to get involved in this whole story? Well, I was very, very lucky. Um, I had, uh, I was working on another story. It was going to be a young adult novel on horse racing. And um, I had a whole bookcase full of books and I had writer's block and I didn't, I never owned a horse. I, I really didn't do that much horseback riding, you know, um, but uh, so I, I felt like I needed some kind of book that or research that I could know what a piece of tack was, you know, what do they call, you know, the blanket, like the saddle cloth is, you know, for racing, you know, getting all the the real particular details that you have to have to, you know, really make your story solid when you're writing it, whether it's a novel or whether it's um, uh, a book like Reckless's story and getting the history right. Just, I've worked really hard to make sure I got the history right. But with my novel, I just, uh, I needed some inspiration. I had writer's block and I just, I couldn't get to it. So I went to my bookshelf and on my bookshelf was a book called Chicken Soup for the Horse Lover's Soul. And all of the chicken soup books, you know, are collections of short stories of the people whose topic that they are, you know, uh, talking about in the book. So I thought, okay, this has got to, you know, tell me how to muck out a stall or what kind of, you know, uh, herbs to use if they have colic or what do we do, you know, if, uh, you know, with laminitis and, you know, this kind of stuff. So um, I was reading along and in there was a story called Sergeant Reckless, the Mighty Marine. And it was written by a man at Camp Pendleton who was there when she gave birth to her first Colt Fearless at Camp Pendleton. And it was a really funny story. And it's um, actually most of it, except for the redundancies of what she did in Korea, I have in my book. I was able to replicate it in my book. And um, it's just this wonderfully funny story of how these Marines just, you know, got, you know, they didn't know she somehow got out and had an affair with another stallion and it should have been this thoroughbred. And so, I mean, and he's making this whole thing just very, very funny. It's a very, very cute story. And so, um, but I read it and I read what she did in, in South Korea in the Korean War. And uh, I, I was a horse fan. I had all the horse books when I was growing up, you know, and I'm like, okay, why have I never heard about this horse? Who is she? Whatever happened to her? And um, that's when I Googled her name and only four things came up on the internet. Uh, there was a, a magazine article in 1992, Leatherneck Magazine article, which is still the best summation of her story. There was another article written in San Diego about the same time, and then there were two websites that were uh, blogger sites, essentially, or, or where you could post comments or ask questions, uh, military sites. So it took me really six years. The first year, I didn't do too much work on it, but she just wouldn't let go of me. And so um, uh, it took me six years to really research and write the book and track down the Marines that served with her and get their personal Polaroids. And if they weren't alive, I'd reach out to the families like I did Eric Pedersen uh, talking to his son. And um, I'd get as many pictures and stories as I could. And in my book, I have over 130 pictures of Reckless. And uh, so it uh, just was one of these things. I, I made sure that she was never going to be forgotten again. And I actually wrote her screenplay first because I was working with the people. Some of you might remember the Billy Jack films that were very, very popular in the 70s. And I worked with them since for like 35 years. Now, I started when I was out of kindergarten. but. <laughs> But anyway, so, you know, I was working with them and I thought, why isn't this a movie? So I wrote my script first and I was just getting ready to shop it in Hollywood and Steven Spielberg announces War Horse and I can't get a meeting. And I thought, oh my God, of course he would discover my story, but it, thank God it wasn't my story. It was uh, Michael Moore Pergo's book and it was based on the um, War Horse play, stage play in England. 
And so, uh, but still, uh, the greatest director in the world's doing a war horse movie. Yeah, they're not talking to me. So I said, okay, God, not on your timetable. Let me get my book written. Let me get the monuments built. Let me show Hollywood that America demands this kind of film uh, on this story. And I, and I pitch it uh, kind of Sergeant Reckless versus War Horse and basically saying, that you know, you, there is room in the marketplace for another war horse movie. It's like Secretary and Seabiscuit were both racehorses, great racehorses, but each one had a different story to tell. And that's how Reckless and War Horse are. And because she's such a wonderful character, uh, she brings such love and delight and fun to the camp uh, uh, I think it's going to be a, a I, I know it's going to be a, a, a better received film than War Horse. And, and I just know how great it would be if somebody would take a chance on it and get it done. So that'd be great. Anybody else have questions, comments? I have Robin. Yes. Yeah protection did she have when she was making her uh, carrying the ammo? So she really didn't have any protection when she was carrying it, except when the men would show would use her uh, sometimes as a shield going up to uh, the gun sites or the front lines. She was never really up on the front lines, but because her gun was a little farther back, but they would use her as a shield. And they would throw their own personal flak jackets. They would take them off of the, their, themselves and throw their flak jackets over her to protect her because they knew what a, you know, she was a more valuable, uh, such a valuable part of the unit that she needed to be protected. And by protecting her that way um, and having that kind of safety, uh, uh, they, they were a little protected being able to stand behind her. So, but that's all she had, which is really, really quite interesting. Robin, do you know how many horses were um, engaged with our troops during the Korean War? I have not found any other horses used uh, in the Korean War. Now there could be uh, some that were used as pack horses. Uh, there could be mules that were used, but I've I've not found any. You know, in World War II, we we still used horses. We only shipped about forty nine horses over from America over into the um, to the war front, but we procured uh, quite a few, especially in the China, India, Burma um, conflict. Uh, we were, we got about 15,000, I think, mules and horses to help carry the, the loads there. But, uh, you know, it's just really, really interesting. Um, I have just not seen that. That's what really kind of makes her so unique is that um, she was the only one used. And uh, so I, I just love it that she's, she's that much more special. <laughs> good horse stories out there for people to read about. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Say that again. I said they need good horse stories for people who are horse crazy. Who want yes, to that's true. Yeah, absolutely. Horse. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Those are the true stories. Yeah, those are the good yes. ones. Yes, and that's what's so wonderful about it. It is a true story. You can't you can't make it up, you know? I mean, it's just to hear what she does and then to think of how she loved to be with her men because she they were her herd. And I love it because it's such a wonderful love story. It's an incredible love story of her love for them and their love for her. And um, that to me is gonna be a 10 handkerchief film. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Robin. Uh, Hi. Um, which work did you find to be more daunting or more difficult to deal with, uh, the Second World War book or, or the Korean book? And as a follow-up, um, I'll throw it at you right now. Um, in terms of the World War II material, did you happen to come across anything uh, related to the horses at the 
26th Cavalry in the, in the Philippines and 4142. And it sounds like you've touched on uh, the pack animals that were Frank Merrill's outfit in uh, Burma. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting. So I found it for both both books were difficult to research, but in for for different reasons. Um, Reckless was kind of hard because there wasn't really anything uh, in the archives about her. Uh, very few things in the National Archives, maybe about a half a dozen pictures or so. And even in the Marine Corps archives, all these pictures that you're seeing here on Flickr were not available like they are today. And uh, which is, I'm so pleased that they are. But, um, but it was difficult. I had to take ads out in magazines, uh, you know, military magazines and newspapers. And I would have to go online to different military uh, groups and join and start the conversation up about does anybody know Reckless or heard of Reckless and things like that. And so, you know, bit by bit, I would start getting responses from people. And then they would turn me on to other members of their unit um, who are still alive. And so uh, that's, that's why it really took so long to, to, uh, to do the book because I, um, I had to piece it together. Thank goodness Andrew Gear had his book out there uh, because in 54, 55, I think his book came out called Reckless Pride of the Marines. And uh, because it was used as kind of a baseline as to where to start to get um, the research. Now, back when I started this to Google hit, you know, that book was not available anywhere. And I finally found it someplace I think was on eBay. And, uh, but now of course that book is, is also available today, which is, which is wonderful. With World War II, it was interesting because there's a lot out there on World War II, but there's a lot of conflicting stuff as well. And it would be conflicting. It was like the fake news of the day, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. But as I said, I'm a stickler for the facts. And so if I came across um, conflicting information, I would use both resources that I got the information. And then and it, this, I have about 30 pages of notes at the end of my book um, because I wanted to make sure people understood why I came to certain conclusions, uh, but a lot of times um, they would, especially like with the war dogs uh, talking about their work, some of the information was hyped up a little bit uh, because they wanted, they, they needed to let America know that things were going well with the war for them to stay in support of it. And so that kind of made things a little, um, a little hard sometimes when you would uh, you know, see the different kinds of information. And then what happens over time, uh, you know, and especially with the internet, they get one fact wrong and then it goes on forever. It just spirals out the facts you know, are, are out there forever wrong. So it, it really was an interesting, interesting type of thing. But I, as I said, I worked very hard uh, on uh, getting together uh, all the facts. The interesting thing about the War Animals book, which I found so fascinating, was, I don't know if you guys know this, but when World War II started, we did not have a war dog program in place. And, um, uh, so after Pearl Harbor was bombed in 1941, a poodle breeder named Arlene Erlanger got together with her Westminster Dog Show friends and her Kennel Club, American Kennel Club friends, and they started an organization called Dogs for Defense. And Dogs for Defense recruited people's pets. Uh, our first war dogs were actually members of people's family around the country. And 40,000 dogs were donated to the cause, to the war effort. Now, they were better patriots than me because you touch my misty girl, we're skipping World War II and going right to World War III, you know? But they, you know, 20,000 made the cut and 10,425 went on to serve with 
the troops in uh, the Pacific and in um, Europe. And then the Marine Corps also trained uh, Doberman Pinschers, mostly were used by the Marine Corps. And those were donated by the uh, Doberman Pincher Club, who were also people's pets. And they were trained to go over overseas. And so it's, it's really just interesting to see how the history, it, it's just such interesting history with, with all of with all of it. And I did come across the 26th and I'm trying to think of what I remember from it. Um, it's escaping me now, um, but um, I know that there was the Calvary, uh, they, uh, uh, but I, 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 I'm drawing a blank right now. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And I'm very much. I'm looking forward to both books. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, if I don't know, I had talked with Tom about this. Um, my books I, I make available, I usually sell them for $25, but for groups like this, I try to give a military discount, especially like Veterans Day and stuff. So um, each book is $20 and I charge $3 for shipping and handling. And if you want the book, you can either go to my website um and order it they're also available on amazon but i if you wanted to purchase them um and like tom took an order or somebody took an order uh, i could sign them to you directly to whoever you'd like and uh be able to um you know do it that way so you have a nice uh, a nice signature made out to you for being part of this uh wonderful wonderful event And the website is the sergeantreckless.com. Yes, yeah, sergeantreckless.com. Abbreviated SGT. Mm -hmm. And the store is you can go, you can get to the store through there. Um at, and it's or it's store.sergeantreckless.com. And there's mugs and a challenge coin and t-shirts and <laughs> all kinds of fun things to honor her. As I said, I, I can't honor this little pony enough. Yeah, she was not a big horse, was she? She was only 13, a little over 13 hands high. And that's what makes her so mighty. You know, she, we think she was a Jeju pony mixed with a thoroughbred. And the Jeju is a very stocky horse. It's Mongolian out of Mongolian stock. So they were stockier, they had short necks, they had thicker legs. Um, but they would breed and the Jeju pony would race and they would breed those horses with the thoroughbred to give them more speed and agility and uh, finesse, you know, finer, finer lines. And so that's why we think that's what the, the South Korean racing authorities told me that they think that she is that and that's called a Hala horse, H-A-L-L-A. And so uh, Mongolian, the Jejus are usually only about 11 hands high. So they're very, very little ponies. But she was like 13.1, 13.2 in her size, not real big at all. But uh, she made up for that in, with, her, with her determined spirit. Did the Korean family that sold her ever find out what happened to her? Did they? Her I have tried to track them down. I have tried, I reached out to the horse racing. Uh, I have a contact who's a, one of the writers for the horse, not Korean, South Korean racing authority. And, um, and I was back in South Korea in 2016 because they were talking about putting a monument for her back there. And I was hoping that with some of the press and that monument still we're hoping to have happen. It hasn't happened yet. But I'm hoping that something jars um, the memory, you know, of the family uh, once once she becomes because it's an American story now. It's not a South Korean story, so they really wouldn't know about it until there's some kind of press back there. What's nice though is uh, at the Seoul racetrack today. It's a different racetrack, but they have her picture with the recoilless rifle up uh, poster size up in their VIP room. And so I walked into there and I just broke into tears on boohoo and all over, 
all over the place, you know, seeing how they're honoring her and trying to get her back. And there is one race every year around in July, I think, around the armistice uh, called uh, the Acham High race. And so they, they do race. So I'm hoping that somebody might come forward at some point. Uh, it's hard to know really all that is her backstory because even in Gear's book, he says that he changed the name of the young boy for you know protection. Um, and uh, so it's it's just hard to know. Hopefully, hopefully though something will will come out of it, and which would be absolutely phenomenal. Would be absolutely phenomenal. So, yeah, that would be incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we have uh, mined you for as much information as <laughs> heard this evening. This this was a big story. This was incredible. Uh, thank you for thank you for this, and thank you for having me, and thank you for playing the PowerPoint. It made my job easy. <laughs> well, yes, at least we got to see you in that. In yes, that. <laughs> in, indeed, and. Really, if you have any questions at all, uh, please, uh, my email is sergeantreckless at yahoo.com. Uh, you can, you know, and it's on the store. You can get me directly through the store. Uh, any questions at all? Uh, if you order the book online and you can't see where you want to fill out your name, um, I can, uh, I'll contact you to find out how you want me to sign it. And uh, so there's, it's, but it's, it's just really fun. And there's some more different pictures and you'll see other kinds of stories, things that we've done to honor her, um, her presence, which is just really a lot of fun. So I'm very, very grateful for all of this. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you for bringing this incredible story to the world and um, make sure that she uh, gets her due. Um, so. Well, it's, it's my honor and privilege, and uh, I just thank God for her every day, and I know that, you know, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Sergeant Reckless speaking to this wonderful uh, group at your library, and so I really, really appreciate you all coming out, and uh, um, God bless you guys, and uh, oorah Reckless. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for making my job easier. <laughs> <laughs> I know, so Tom, it was, it was looking pretty tough there. I thought, oh my God, Tom's going to have to get up there and start talking about it. <laughs> so thank you again, and I really appreciate it, and you're a wonderful lady. Oh, thank you. You're just very sweet and kind. Thank you, and thank you, Don, for reaching out and getting in touch with me. I really am grateful for that. And uh, who knows, maybe one of these days I'll make it back to your neck of the woods and uh, we'll have to get together and maybe do something in person. Thank you. That's better. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay. God bless you guys. Take care. You too. God bless you. Thank you. And thank you again yeah, for Thank attendance. you all for coming. Appreciate that. <laughs> Yes, so, stop that. Well, there's no more horsing around, so we'll go home. Yeah. Enough horsing around? Yeah. Oh.